worship center as a symbol of Christ, the light of the world, a traditional perspective on Jesus being in our midst. We also know how Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And so while this candle provides us with inspiration, a focal point in our worship center, and um, light in our lives as we are gathered together in this relatively brief time, we know that when it is extinguished at the end of our worship service, the light does not go out because we, as the people of God, go out through the doors into the world and bring the light that we receive here with us. I welcome you to Bloom in the Desert Ministries, United Church of Christ, and Reconciling Ministries Congregation. We are a church that is doing our very best to live up to the modern motto of the United Church of Christ that says, Whoever you are and wherever you are on the journey of faith, you are welcome here. And so it is our intention to be welcoming in as broad a spectrum as possible, what, knowing that in the midst of the uh, dimensions, to use a word that's coming up in our first hymn, in the midst of the dimensions of the Coachella Valley, we are doing our best to be as diverse as we can, representing the people of God and that are here so that we know that we are people who are black and white and red and yellow and brown, that in God's creation people love one another in a variety of ways. We welcome people who are straight and gay and bisexual. We know that identity is something that comes from the inside and so we know that we welcome people who are cisgender and transgender, gender non-declaring, uh, intersex, non-binary, it is our desire to welcome people as you see yourself from the inside out instead of an identity we would foist upon you. So we do our very best at that. And so if we make mistakes or if we have wrong assumptions, simply offer to one another in this safe space um, a, a word that brings us into good relationship with you. And that way our welcome continues to be of the value and integrity that we hope that it is. We know also that we come from a wide variety of backgrounds and educational arenas and financial abilities and political perspectives and geographic uh, references and homes, especially this time of year when people are uh, migrating and um, seeking asylum in Palm Springs from the snow uh, that chases them. Uh, we, are, we, are wel we welcome all people here in this time and do our very best to have that be a a lovely so time now is the time when we have been scattered to now be gathered. We've come from far away and nearby. We've come in various states of mind. <laughs> Let it be that we are able to center ourselves in this place for the worship of God and the care of one another. As you're able, please rise and join me in reading the response to this call to worship. We are in the presence of the living, compassionate God. We remember God made us in the image of goodness. We are the reflection of our creators. Sustain us then with the blessings of our sisters as much as brothers. Ground us with friends. Bless us with desire to seek truth. That's how we can help our communities find healing. We are encouraged to bless one another.
eternal source of creativity and mercy, hear now our silent prayers. To all of our silent prayers, let the people say, Amen. 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 Receive now these words of encouragement throughout our sacred text when God calls women and men to faithful living. God gives us this clear promise, I will be with you. Amen. Amen. Let us now receive the word. Our Hebrew scripture reading for today is taken from the book of Psalms, Psalm 91, verses 14 through 16. If you don't trust me, I think you can read along in your bulletin. Um, because you love me, I will deliver you. I will rescue you because you acknowledge my name. You will call upon me, and I will answer you. I will be with you in trouble. I will deliver you and honor you. I will satisfy you with a long life and show you my salvation. Here ends the Hebrew scripture reading. rise if you are able for the reading of the gospel. The gospel 
Bible scripture reading for today is from the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Jesus returned from the Jordan, filled with the Holy Spirit, and she led him to the desert for 40 days, where he was tempted by the devil. Jesus ate nothing during that time, at the end of which he was famished. The devil said to Jesus, if you are God's own, command this stone to turn into bread. Jesus answered, scripture has it, we don't live on bread alone. Then the devil took Jesus up higher and showed him all the nations of the world in a single instant. The devil said, I'll give you all the power and the glory of these nations. The power has been given to me and I can give it to whomever I wish. Prostate yourself in homage before me and it will all be yours. In reply, Jesus said, scripture has it, you will worship the most high God, God alone will you adore. Then the devil led Jesus to Jerusalem set him up on the parapet of the temple and said, if you are God's own, throw yourself down from here. For the scripture has it, God will tell the angels to take care of you, with their hands still support you, that you may never stumble on a stone. Jesus said to the devil in reply, it also says, do not put God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, Jesus was left alone. The devil awaited another opportunity. Here ends the reading of the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now I'm not going to say the devil made me do it. <laughs> but I made a mistake earlier in the worship service when uh, I was noting which version of that uh, hymn, Our, Ours the Journey, we're singing. That's the one I was planning to offer in June. So now, now you have it. <laughs> Come back in June for the version I was talking about today. <laughs> Let's pray. Bless us, loving God, as we continue in our worship time together. We know that you are blessing us continually. We pray that we are able to open our hearts and minds to receive that and to understand your care for each one of us as we're gathered here among people who can further love us in your name. We continue to develop our identity as your people, as the body of Christ in the world. We know that that takes many shapes and forms via each one of us. We pray that your blessings will be what enables us to do what needs to be done and be who needs to be in every particular time. As we continue in our worship today, we are thankful for the beautiful music that inspires us and the words that call to our attention. We know that there are many words that we're singing and words that we're thinking and praying and hearing. We pray that today, in this time, the word that you have for each of us is what is able to make it to our hearts. We continue to be here and we're thankful, loving God. Thankful so that we pray as the psalmist prayed so many years ago, that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth are acceptable to you. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Lest we think our times are unique, let us remember when Bloom was born. Back in 2002, our nation was <coughs> rattling sabers globally and grieving locally over the horrific losses of September 11, 2001. Mike and I quit our jobs, sold everything, and moved here with a commitment to try to do inclusive ministry. For us, it was all new in 2002. <laughs> it was our vision and, a dem and demonstration that an out gay clergy person with a Methodist background could be a good pastor in a local setting. Soon after arriving in the desert on July 9th, 2002, after a zigzaggy, I called it a land cruise 
across the country visiting historical sites and national parks. We got involved as we were doing very early organizing and trying to figure out what to do. There was an effort going on to organize the, and a union among the casino workers in order to here in Palm Springs, in order to give them a better voice in their work and a higher standard of living. There was no reconciling Methodist or open and affirming ministries in the Coachella Valley. The closest one was the open and affirming UCC church in Redlands. There were many persons living in the area whose hearts had been broken and spirits had been abused by preachers and congregations who rejected homosexuals from church. Soon after moving into our first apartment over on Skyview Drive, a card came in the mail from the Reverend Jean Audrey Powers, a powerhouse woman, if you know her, in the United Methodist Church, who was then retired and living over at Pilgrim Place in Claremont. She sent us a card and a check for $100, which in those days, $100 is still $100, but you know, that was when we were first getting any sort of contributions like that. So it was very welcome. And also welcome in the card was this message that she sent to us. She wrote and encouraged us to bloom, blossom, and celebrate. Bloom, blossom, and celebrate. Now these are just a few of the many, many, many dynamics that were in motion. As the idea of Bloom in the Desert grew from a seed, from a sparkle, into budding ministries. And now look at us, blooming in so many ways. In today's fantastical gospel reading, we find tenants tenets of faith consideration from before and since it's been written. The quick tour of tempting offers that uh, Jesus is made might sound like a fun weekend to some. The concentration in this story is on three levels, which were basic to faith in whatever Middle Eastern tribe the ancient hearers would identify. And it's certainly easy in this case to make comparisons across the millenniums from those devilish offers to today's variety and widely touted social, financial, and career aspirations. The countercultural stands that Jesus takes in Luke's gospel, in the story of these famous temptations, the countercultural stands that he takes are three. And they're pretty easy things to remember. Humanity is nourished on more, with more, than physical satisfactions. All power and glory in the world does not measure up to the worth of a meaningful relationship with our God. And it is folly to think that we can tempt God in any way into doing what we want done. Now, this is part of the continuing story of Jesus. The Gospel writers recently had him up on a mountaintop interacting with the prophets, being confirmed by God's voice and shining brightly in what is called the transfiguration with the effervescence of God's approval. And then they show him in our story today going to the desert for the great biblical number of 40 days and 40 nights, which really amounts to the writer not knowing exactly how long it was, but just knowing that it was appropriately long enough to do what needed to be done. Then he is tempted and outsmarts the trickster. And Jesus does all the right things to make ministry work. These are the core values to ponder in our own faith journeys and in our daily lives. Physical satisfactions 
do not provide all for life. All the power and glory in the world that is being claimed, that we see being claimed every day, is of no value or no similar value to a meaningful relationship with God. And it's folly for us to think that we can tempt God into doing what we want done. They speak to ordinary human conditions and many hopes. And in our world today, they are contrary to the prevailing ways of thinking. In the spirit of that way of thinking, I humbly hope that we will remember that Bloom was founded, Bloom was co-founded as a <coughs> contrarian action. For one thing, we wanted to bring a faith perspective to life that would challenge ordinary Christian perspectives. I know I wanted to preach the gospel in a way that helped it become more relevant in people's lives and help us make decisions about our actions at home, in school, in church, and in the voting booth. This is the gospel of Jesus that seeks truth in human interactions and inspires us to work for compassion and justice in the world. This is the gospel that had us on street corners protesting against the Iraq war when it broke out and had people coming up to us and saying, I'm finally glad to see a Christian church out doing what we hoped the Christian church would do. So now today, let me introduce you to someone. Her name is the Reverend Dr. Karen L. Wiseman. She used to be a United Methodist pastor from Texas. She was in some of the very same meetings that Mike and I attended for the start of the Church Within a Church movement. That group was the small group, that small national group of people working for church change after the Methodist General Conference of 2000. We hear a lot about what's going on now after the conference meeting that just happened in February. But quite frankly, this sort of thing has been going on since 1972, 1984, 2000, 1994, 2000, 2004, and again this year. It was the actions of the United Methodist General Conference in 2004 that made this congregation decide that they didn't want to be Methodist anymore and decided to move into the UCC. Mike and I were involved in that early group, the Church Within a Church movement, which supported Bloom <coughs> early on. We were active with the group, and they were very supportive of us in our co-founding. Now, back in the old days, in the early 2000s, as Bloom was beginning and the Church Within a Church movement was finding its way through organized meetings, Karen, who I just introduced you to, did not cotton to a mission to do things that might get people in trouble. And as a result, she stopped participating in our reform movement so that she could remain viable as a closeted lesbian among the Texas Methodists. I do not know what happened to her in the meantime, so I was a little surprised to learn about a month ago that she is now a UCC minister in Pennsylvania. <laughs> In response to the recent actions of the United Methodist General Conference, Reverend Dr. Wiseman thought that she still had authority to speak. I believe we all do. And she wrote some challenging words for clergy who are her friends on Facebook. She referenced the early reports of the Ministry of Methodism's founder, John Wesley, who was an Anglican priest, died an Anglican priest, who decided to go against the conventional way of doing things in the Anglican church in the mid to late 1700s. Karen wrote to us, to the clergy and to everyone that are her friends, clergy and laity alike, are you preaching to comfort the comfortable or are you willing to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable? Are you going where you need to be to be with the people. 
John Wesley, she says, <laughs> preached the latter and went to the places he needed to go. A page from John Wesley's diary in the 18th century reads as follows. Sunday morning, May 5th, preached at St. Anne's, was asked not to come back anymore. <laughs> Sunday p.m., May 5th, preached at St. John's. Deacons said, get out and stay out. Sunday a.m., May 12th, preached at St. Jude's. Can't go back there either. <laughs> Sunday p.m., May 12th, preached at St. George's. Kicked out again. Sunday a.m., March 19th, preached at St. Somebody Else's. Deacons called special meeting and said I couldn't return. Karen is giving her paraphrase. Sunday p.m., May 19th, preached on the street. Kicked off the street. Sunday a.m., May 26th, preached in a meadow. Chased out of the meadow as a bull was turned loose during the service. <laughs> Sunday a.m., June 2nd, preached out at the edge of town, kicked off the highway. Sunday p.m., June 2nd, afternoon service, preached in a pasture. 10,000 people came to hear me. Don't give up. Don't give in. Right now, we all need a word from God about grace and love and affirmation. And Reverend Dr. Karen says, preach the damn gospel. <laughs> now, Reverend Dr. Karen was a Facebook posting in response to the actions of today's Methodists. It wasn't a lead up to an advertisement for an afternoon Sunday worship service. While we do our best each Sunday to offer the extravagant welcome we aspire to offer, there are still church people causing hurt in the world and sociopolitical conditions that are doing people in. There are still church officials telling some people to get out and not return. There are still people turning bulls loose in the meadows of progressive Christian thinking and inclusive church missions in order to disrupt and scatter the gatherings of thoughts and actions. And 16 years after starting a Methodist outreach service, outside, not in a meadow, but in a rose garden, we are still here in the mission field. We do not have 10,000 coming to hear me yet. <laughs> Keep preaching. <laughs> But we had 10 times as many people in the Mesquite Ballroom Friday night for Spring Fling 10 as we had in the garden on March 9th, 2003 for Bloom's first worship service. We are still here to do unconventional Christian ministry with traditional characteristics, progressive thinking, unwavering welcome, congregational leadership, community organization, social justice witness, and intelligent approaches to learning and liturgy. That's how we now blossom. Anniversaries are not always happy, though I think Bloom's Sweet 16 is a good one. These uninterrupted 16 years of Sunday morning worship have been meant by me to bring healing to people, to renew relationships, and nurturing growth to our spiritual involvement. Sunday worship is our time to connect and refuel for the work week ahead. It is a time to let go of whatever limits us and embrace whatever we can find in this service, somewhere in there, to help us re-enter the world with goodness as our goal. The surroundings we establish every Sunday are meant to support the work of God's Holy Spirit as she leads us into our futures and will 
have both that will have both happiness and sadness. The great dynamics of congregational church development are no good when we faith, when when we focus on what tricksters of the world encourage us to value. Instead, we turn to each other for love and our words for support. The UCC banner that we hang in this sacred space every week is shorthand for our mission together. Look at each of those phrases and pray that you will be able to internalize the values that are given there. So often I focus on the one that says forgive often. I think also one could be parentheses added there, ask forgiveness often. Say I'm sorry often. These kinds of values, that's who we are now and who we want to be. And that's what we celebrate. I was reminded by a TV show recently, I think it was last night, that the first half of Langston Hughes' poem entitled Dreams says, hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Whether you call it a vision that Mike and I had or a dream, something beyond brought Mike and me here and has held us fast to worship weekly with our bloomers and friends in this community now for 16 years. Now let us continue to bloom, to blossom, to celebrate, and to fly. Thanks be to God. Amen. people are aging in isolation, or growing up in violence, or suffering in silence, may our United Church of Christ have the courage to be a witness to a more excellent way. Through these gifts, enable us to be your justice, kindness, and humility. Now, as you are able, let's.